uh, it sounds like your thesis of global stabilization is playing out. Well, it sounds like, uh, you know, so far all the hard data seems to be supporting, you know, what the central banks have been working on all year of uh, keeping, you know, the manufacturing weakness away from a potential recession. And so far, the hard data on the economy has, seems to be so solidifying those things that so far that hasn't affected the labor market, hasn't affected business spending as much as it used to or people thought it was going to be. But overall, you know, it seems like the hard data on the economy seems to be pretty resilient, consistent with what is called a soft landing of what the Fed and the other central banks may want to have for the global economy. Do you believe that that kind of stabilization can survive if phase one is is pushed out to, say, the spring? Well, I do. I do think that that's the key component. And, and clearly trade has become a bigger component because it does have an effect not only on certain parts of the manufacturing part of the world and clearly will affect potential wage growth, uh, but it also affects what is the critical part of where we are in the market today, which is sentiment. Um, you know, the, the sentiment component of reaching a potential deal could actually be a big tailwind for the markets going forward. I think, you know, consistent with uh, hard economic data, you know, a potential deal, I don't necessarily think we're going to get to a big deal, but certainly a progress could actually be a tailwind that will take risk on markets even further up. On the other hand, if there is no progress or potentially a break in negotiations, that could actually, you know, put us to the other side. We're in that part of the market where because we have had a solid year, it could actually go one way or another. So I think, you know, looking for that December 15 and a potential phase one uh, progress is going to be key for where the market goes, at least in the short run. And Brent, do you expect to that point uh, to see higher volatility as uh, we, we reach your end? Sure. I think in general, there's usually higher volatility um, as these trade uncertainties unfold. And so December 15th is certainly a big date on the calendar. And I actually do think you will get a phase one deal. A lot of the news about, you know, the president suggesting that he would be happy putting this off to the election. I actually think that was for phase two. And I think that gives him some room um, to actually suspend negotiations next year a bit to, de to tamp down the volatility from the negotiations. But I do think he needs phase one done because I think he needs something for his constituents see the farmers, that he needs to take to the election to give them something. Otherwise, they might wonder what this was all about. Okay, so 10, 10 days he has to get this phase one deal effectively completed. Uh, how much do you think the markets are pricing in that that will actually occur? And what is the downside risk that you're seeing if that doesn't come to fruition? Sure, I think the markets have certainly priced in positive news on the trade front, so I do think there would be some downside. I don't think it's nearly as much as people imagine because, as Omar mentioned, the opposite side of the coin, which happened last year, is happening this year. You actually have all those central banks around the globe that were pushing down with trade war last year are now pushing back up. And I do think they hold the upper hand in that battle because they are much, much bigger and much more important than the smaller trade war that may occur. I think it's a detractor to growth, but not an absolute negative and not a recession causer. Omar, in terms of sectors, I mean, assuming given the sort of the bedrock we just established with both of you, uh, how do you play it both within sectors uh, in North America and when you compare U.S. to, say, Europe and Asia? Well, you know, I, I certainly think that, you know, this is a great opportunity for people to look at their portfolios and start thinking about rebalancing strategies. You know, we're coming off of a very good, you know, solid year for the equity markets. We actually see, you know, the consistency in fixed income markets as well, where things seem to be very stable. So uh, what we have observed over the last couple of months is this natural rotation in this part of the cycle going from a very defensive, you know, momentum type sectors. Uh, to a more, you know, potentially cyclical. I would not necessarily say we're at the point where value starts to work harder and that you can actually have to go there with your two feet. But certainly it's an opportunity to balance the strategies and we start going into cyclical areas like industrials, like materials, like consumer cyclicals, where you actually have seen potentially underweights over the course of the year. And those are sectors that could potentially expand conditional on the fact that the economic data continues the way we laid out. So, you know, moving and start rotating away from defensive into cyclicals is something that we continue to encourage people to do. And Brent, similar rotation with you? Yeah, we, we like small caps within the U.S., so we've uh, increased the cyclicality of our portfolios in the U.S. by moving from large caps to small caps and shying away from REITs um, pretty heavily. The, the thesis there is that last year, if you looked, uh, certainly the central bank was tightening. We were kind of at a point where small caps had been overloved because they were thought to be a defensive play against the trade war. Um, and the macro environment was turning against them with uh, real rates becoming positive. 
Now you look, they've underperformed for a year dramatically. Um, the macro environment is turning positive where I don't think there's any chance next year, even if the economic data improves quite a bit, the Fed would ever consider hiking rates just given the president and Bill Dudley's back in force. And so, you know, I think that's small caps. And then I also would note that one thing that's been under underappreciated is the world is getting better. Chinese OECD LEI turned back in February. You're seeing that show up in the data. And so if you have better global growth next year, the world will outperform the U.S., which we think is likely.